Good afternoon or good evening for those overseas. I'm Lynn Prasker Schultz, the Director of Programming and Community Outreach at the Vilna. Thank you all for joining us today. We're thrilled to welcome our featured speakers, Laura Lempert and Eliyahu Stern, to discuss the lasting impact of the Vilna Gone. We would like to thank the Lithuanian Culture Institute and the General Consulate of Lithuania in New York, specifically, specifically Gitana Skripakaiti, as well as the Lithuanian National Library, without whom this event would not be possible. For those of you watching, you are among over 125 people from around the world turning into the, tuning into this program today. If you're unfamiliar with the Vilna, we are a Jewish cultural organization located in historic Beacon Hill, Boston. We are housed in a newly renovated 100-year-old former synagogue that was built by Jewish immigrants from Vilnius, Lithuania back in 1919. Today, we focus on bringing people together through arts, culture, and ideas. If you are local to Boston, we invite you to join us for a personal tour of our historic building on July 27th or August 12th. And if you're not local to Boston, we hope that you will come and visit us on your next trip.
Before we get started, Mrs. Fayina Kulonsky, the chairperson of the Lithuanian Jewish community, wishes to welcome us. We're sorry she can't be with us live, but I'm happy to play this pre-recorded video. One moment. Excellences, ambassadors, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, I am very honored to uh, be able to give uh, some, to say some words uh, in the beginning of uh, your conference and to send uh, very warm uh, <clears throat> regards from our Lithuanian Jewish community. We have had a very interesting year. I'm sorry about Corona and I'm sorry about uh, all these um, uh, diseases which, uh, we, uh, which stopped the life not only of our community, but anyway, we um, were successful to celebrate 300 years of uh, one of the most famous Litvak uh, Rabbi Gaon. Uh, and um, uh, really, it means um, a lot uh, for us. It, uh, it means um, not only that uh, Litvaks um, uh, who were studying uh, uh, Judaism, they studied not only uh, Judaism, but also maths and uh, astronomy and uh, other subjects which are very important for the educated people. And uh, Gaon was uh, one of them, uh, and especially, especially a person who could um, uh, made uh, comments um, uh, for the uh, Torah. Uh, not everybody um, read Torah, not everybody understand at all what's written there, but with the help of uh, Gaon's um, uh, comments, uh, uh, it is much <clears throat> easier to understand. It is very interesting his trip or his trip in dreams to Israel. So he was one of the first Zionists. And um, we have a wonderful picture which shows um, a map, uh, which shows, um, uh, describes his trip to Israel. Nobody knows if uh, that happened, but um, uh, at least we have um, uh, this uh, wonderful uh, a wonderful map. And I have a special, uh, yeah, I forgot to say that our community and designer of our community, Mrs. Victoria Sidaraita, created a medal and a coin which is dedicated to go on and uh, really um, they, they have so many symbols that if you look at it, you'll see uh, uh, not um, not less symbols than you, we have in Torah or uh, in Talmud uh, um, uh, that was described in the medal. Uh, I have a special thanks to the ambassador um, Milunas, who was uh, a certain time ambassador in Ireland. And in Ireland are living um, a lot of Jews from Lithuania, Litvaks. Uh, the, they are the heart of uh, the Jewish community of Ireland. And in this um, nice country, I've got a gift uh, from uh, the Jewish Museum. Uh, the gift um, uh, calls, uh, have a name. It's a book, story of uh, the Vilna Gaon, written by Oshri. Leonard Oshri. We translated this book into Lithuanian language. Uh, we used the uh, design of a very famous painter, uh, Ilya Bereznitsky. Uh, and we published the book, which is very easy to read for adults and for children. Uh, as a slogan of this book are the words of um, Go on. Uh, that um, he started, uh, he learned a lot of, from his teachers. Uh, he learned even more uh, from his friends. Uh, but uh, uh, the biggest amount of knowledge he, he got from his pupils. 
Uh, and uh, mm, uh, this book also includes um, uh, a lot of um, explanation of the Jewish religion. Uh, I'm sorry that it does not um, mm, include the letter of ethic, uh, which was written by uh, Rabbi Gaon before he left um, his family. Uh, to uh, to travel to Israel and this uh, uh, letter of ethnic uh, has a lot of similarities uh, to Koelet. So it's like a moral code uh, for a lot of people, even those who are secular, but um, it's very, very useful to read. So <clears throat> uh, I'm very happy that I can share with you uh, this is my thoughts, and I wish the conference all the best, and I hope that all of you uh, will get uh, uh, a lot of uh, additional knowledges up about uh, the Gaon Mi Vilna. Thank you very much. Thank you, Feina. We uh, love to hear from you. Now back to our program at hand. I know you are all very anxious to hear experts Eliyahu Stern and Lara Lampert talk about this subject. Um, a few moments of uh, notes about etiquette. At any point, please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A box uh, by accessing that at the bottom of your taskbar. Please do not access or ask questions in the chat. The chat is used to comment, reflect, get to know one another, but please uh, refrain from asking questions in the chat and put those into the Q&A. Um, the speakers will talk uh, for about 45 minutes and then we will jump to audience Q&A. So again, ask any questions you'd like in the Q&A box. In a moment, I will post the speaker's bios in the chat feature. But before we do that, we're going to watch a very short film. It's only 42 seconds on the Vilna Gayon. And give me one second and I will put that up. Oops, this is working. All right. Laura, if you would please turn on your screens and your sound, we welcome you to the virtual Vilna stage. Thank you so much. Hello. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you very much, Lynn. And um, thank you everybody for um, coming to be here with us today. Um, we're uh, deeply honored um, that so many of you remain interested in one of the most enigmatic and charismatic uh, figures in uh, the modern Jewish experience, and not just for Jews in the modern period, but more generally for Lithuanian culture and um, in terms of the history of um, of modern Western uh, intellectual thought. Um, the Vilna Gone ranks as, as one of, and remains one of the most captivating figures um, of modern Jewish history for so many people still uh, today. It's a shame that we can't all right now be in Vilnius as we were supposed to be last year um, to celebrate the Gone's 300th birthday but um, one of the advantages of Zoom is that we could share this event with so many more people from across the world. So I'm joined today uh, with uh, one of my colleagues and one of the great resources that scholars have around the world 
for tapping into Lithuanian culture and on the history of luminaries such as the Goan of Vilna, uh, Lara Lampar. Um, so I'm here with Lara, who really right now is in some ways ground zero for the study of, of those such as the Goan and of the great Litvak uh, history of, um, of the Jewish people. So Lara, I, I will first want to ask you, why are we here 300 years after this person was born celebrating his, celebrating his birth? What about him makes him such an enduring uh, figure for, um, for Lithuanian culture today, so much so that the, the state of Lithuania um, named 2020 the year of the Vilna Gone. What, would, what is it about this person? Who, who was he? Tell us a little bit about him and what makes him still such a compelling figure uh, for people today. Thank you, Ali. It's a real pleasure to discuss uh, the figure of Vilnagon even after the uh, uh, designed year was uh, is already finished because we'll never finish speaking of him. And uh, beginning to answer your question, I would refer to your own world, words that he is more uh, the one of the most charismatic and, on the other hand, enigmatic figures. It is a paradox in its in itself, and it. It's the intrigue of the image and the figure of Vilnagon that we, I don't suppose we will solve it uh, during the next 45 minutes, but we, we can try to speak about that. And I would like now to read a small fragment from the epitaph of the Vilnagon on the, which the, the, his tomb survived and the, the, the epitaph survived. And we can see it uh, now and only the small part uh, and it goes like that. The mysteries of the Bible, the Talmud, the Kabbalah, and all the sacred books were clear to you, as if you had received the, this all directly from our ancient sages. The unrivaled researcher of the Bible, the Mishnah, both Talmuds, all collections of religious law, the Kabbalah books, and actually the actual names of the multiple uh, works of rabbinic literature are falling there, I will not quote that, <laughs> and creator of the corrected versions. Neither major nor minor problems of the sacred texts did, le uh, did he ever left unsolved until the texts became as if they had just been received on Mount Sinai. Having corrected numerous textual inaccuracies he brought back the opportunity to perform the Torah commandments accurately to the great joy of the people. Could you imagine many figures who would uh, deserve such uh, an epitaph, which would go to such length underlying uh, their academic, actually academic accomplishments. But for me, what is very important is the last line that those uh, accomplishments made the whole people uh, more accurate in their performance of the Torah commandments and brought them joy, the joy of performing those commandments. I think it's a very interesting text in itself because the, we don't know who, who wrote this epitaph, but it was clearly a very, very learned person. On the other hand, this person brought the opinion of the community on it's actually it's an epitaph of a spiritual leader and uh, i would i would like only to before i want uh, i would like you to 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 add to that i only want to underline one more thing that anyway the text is long but it is it has its limits right the text mm -hmm. of the epitaph See, still uh, it was important for the anonymous authors to name all the branches, you may say, of the Torah study, studies of the rabbinic literature, because uh, it is the scope, the competence of that scholar, that uh, outstanding scholar, that is also very unusual. As you know, of course, many rabbinical scholars specializes in some or 
like a couple of branches or several branches of Torah study, not so we will not go on. And here I, I would ask, uh, I would like you to add as an expert on Vilna Gaon to, to that same question. Well, I think, you know, Lara, the interesting thing here is, um, you know, the, the Gaon was born in 1720 and dies in 1797. In terms of what you, you know, read to us about his life, on some level, it, it, it's very similar to the way many, um, many Torah luminaries or great sages of Israel have been described as deeply learned, as mastering certain canons. Now, with the Gon, there's some differences. I think, as you were highlighting, the wide range. Um, on the one hand, he was a great legalist. On the other hand, also a great Kabbalist. You know, in, in the Jewish tradition, we have great Kabbalists, great philosophers, and we have great legalists, but very few were able to, to, to combine both. Maimonides, of course, was one in terms of philosophy and law, Nachmanides another, and, and the Gon ranks in that tradition of being somebody who um, had both a philosophical and a, um, and a Kabbalistic mind, as well as a, a, a legalistic one. Um, but I, I, I think what, what, what's most interesting is, as you're pointing out here, is the way he becomes attached to a certain society and culture. Uh, and the way in which he comes to symbolize a certain kind of cultural ethos that becomes attached to his city uh, that he lived in. And, you know, the going... On the one hand, as somebody who features very prominently in the debates of his age, most notably in terms of the great debate of his age over Hasidism and other town debates that were taking place with the chief rabbi at that time in Vilna. Um, but on the, on the other hand, and, and, and also with somebody who certainly, um, well, to whatever degree he was an ascetic, and whatever ascetic practices he had, as we know, he spoke to very few people. He, he sure was able to make time uh, and engage enough with, with human beings to have eight children. So um, what you also have here, which is, is, is quite fascinating, is his relationship to other people, which on the one hand is something that his biographers describe as him being very reticent and, um, and antisocial, but on the other hand, there are few figures that loom larger in our social, Jewish social consciousness historically than the legacy of the Gon in terms of a mitnagid, a litva, or just simply the legacy of, of genius. I mean, to give you one example that's always interested me is the amount of people who claim to be a descendant of the Gon. There's at least two to three books just written on his genealogy of people who want to be considered as part of his or, or claim to be part of his family. And, and they range from, um, they range from the, the, the daughter of the, la, of, the pre, of, 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 uh, of the ambassador to the UN, Samantha Powers, to a teacher of mine, uh, Daniel Boyarin, and, and, and many others um, uh, across the world. But I, I think, you know, one of the things that I've always found most interesting is, is that history that attaches the going to Vilna's larger culture. And, and I'm just wondering if you, you know, if you've seen in your collections or what you can still see through books and, and artifacts in the libraries that tie those two things together and that, that kept his legacy alive socially? Uh, I'm really grateful for that question because actually this point interests, interests me uh, maybe most of all. I'm not a rabbinic scholar myself uh, and, and what interests me is a cultural, you know, uh, cultural texture of the city I live in, of Vilnius, through the through ages and in from in that regard of course the figure of Vilnagon the image of Vilnagon uh, is very crucial so uh, as you already pointed out many uh, speak about his social um, uninvolvement you may say right uh, and and of course uh, 
we know for only one fact speaks volumes that during his lifetime, he wasn't even interested in publishing his works. So during his lifetime, very privileged few actually had physical access to him and could hear his teaching. Other people just didn't have that possibility. So, I, so now the question is why he was so famous even in his life, lifetime and more so uh, after his death. Where comes that knowledge of his scope, of his erudition, of his competence, which uh, reflects itself even in that epitaph? Actually, it's the, 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 the same year he dies. He's already known for, for all that. Of course, there was a great influence of his disciples, but it's not exactly what I uh, want uh, to stress here. What I want to say that in just folk imagination, in uh, every, every man imagination, he loomed large, of course, without any, any uh, real access to, to this giant. To say yeah. uh, one thing, even if any of those people who rhapsodized him could actually access his, uh, his uh, study room and hear what he had to say, or yeah. they, they wouldn't be able to no, perceive no. his knowledge. Of course not. As, as a scholar says, it was uh, actually addressed to elite, or let's say, uh, many of those people read, actually read and studied all his leg uh, legacy when it was printed. Of course not. So how come that he was so important a figure in the pantheon of uh, Jewish leaders of Vilna? And here the key uh, was in your words that it is it was very important in uh, building the identity, the cultural identity of a Vilna Jew, of a Vilna Litvak Jew. Of course, we, are, we can speak about Litvaks only after the war, after the conflict uh, between the Mitnagdim and Hasidim, and Mitnagdim, the synonym, of course, is, is Litvaks. Litvak is not a Jew who is born in Lithuania or uh, comes from Lithuania. No, it is a dis ideological descendant, actually of Vilna Gaon and his disciples. And for that, you even didn't need to be such a learned person, but you should attach yourself to the values proclaimed in that learning. And one of those values is always, is always to strive to intellectuality, even if you are not exactly and accurately could perceive the hates mm -hmm. uh, which Vilna Gaon, uh, uh, where Vilna Gaon uh, was. Of course, it is impossible, but, but to strive to, to make this your life work, to go, if you are, um, I don't know, artisan, and you go after your work, hard work day to, to Beit Midrash and study some book, even very, uh, not very difficult one, like like Abraham, uh, Abraham Danzig's uh, oh. The Life of a, a, oh, yeah, yeah. a, a Man. Nothing, uh, any, anything, psalms, anything, but just to make an effort. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most devoted uh, Gaon disciples, the Chaim of uh, Ben Yitzhak of Volozhin, who later, later, uh, 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 not made, uh, established the famous, uh, the famous yeshiva. He spoke of Vilna Gaon as a person who just rejected the mystical revelance. He speaks of him of a hard working intellectual. And for him, for Haim, is a, this is a notion he wants to, trans, to transmit about his teacher. To that, every Lithuanian or Vilna Jew could relate, and they did. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, a lot of people are probably listening to us today. They're probably asking, is there something I could read of the Vilna Gaon? Um, what, what, what can I read to understand what, what it is you're getting at? And I, 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 would, I would say one of the most fascinating things about him is, is that there were very few people who actually could ever read his works. Now, one of the things, you know, that you pointed out 
I think is a, a far more savvy move on his part than simply, um, you know, piety or humility was this not publishing in his lifetime. I think for every academic or intellectual who's a uh, scholar, researcher, who's ever published a book knows that 50% of writing the book is in the editing and in the challenges of publication. And that's with, and that's still with emails. So, you know, at that time you would have to go to the publishing house. You would, you know, you would, you would have to be sitting there with a lot of times with the, the uh, with the printer. So um, by the Go not publishing, it's a fascinating thing to point out. The publishing of the Gones works took over 100 years. They were one of the major intellectual projects along with the publication of the Vilna Shas in the 19th century by the Ram Press. Another one of the great projects of the Ram Press was simply the publication of the Gohm's writings. They spent a fortune of money buying various notes of his from different students or uh, disciples that had those notes. And then um, and then farming them out to different people, different scholars in the 19th century who could help work on creating editions for them. But one of the things that we forget is there's no way the Gohm would have produced the amount he is now ascribed to producing had he actually been involved in the publication of his own works in his lifetime. So it was a very, very wise move on his part, but, but one that also suggested you still, you still have to have people invested enough in your works to sit there and slave over them. And so the, the very act of publishing his work, which was a major project of the Jewish intelligentsia of the 19th century, showed their deep investment also in his legacy and what it, it, meant, um, it meant to them. So, you know, one of the things I think that, 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 that is critical to note is the way Vilna as a kind of Jerusalem of Lithuania emerges in the 19th century, also along with that image of the Gon. And, and like you said, you know, we tend to think, oh, being Jewish is always an intellectual endeavor. Um, not so. Um, there are a lot of different Jewish movements that focus on a whole range of different identities. But the one that's most um, attributed and most closely aligned with that of the going is that deep critical sense, that capacity to look at something and ask a set of very critical questions on, is this really the right text? Is something missing here? What, what are we not understanding? And then to apply that also back on ourselves, on our lives, on our action. That, kind of critical approach that runs through his own interrogation of texts all the way through the Musar movement in the 19th century, which focused on scrutinizing and adopting a critical approach to our egos and what drives us as human beings and what propels us and what's behind our actions, that same critical sense would follow through all the way from the Gones emphasis on texts to also a certain posture towards society, towards ourselves as human beings, towards world affairs. And I think that that, you know, those become central features to a certain kind of Litvak uh, identity that both transcends the Gones life and also at the same time um, is propelled by it. Um, so I'm, I'm also wondering if we could just, you know, maybe talk a little bit more broadly. Why, why are, are Lithuanians, why, you know, not just Jews, but, but Lithuanians more generally, why do they, in what ways are they still, do they still see the Gon as, as part of their histories? I mean, probably many of the people in, in our audience today, some from the United States, you know, ha might have had to be descendants of those who come from Lithuania, um, maybe even from Vilna. So what, 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 what is that legacy like today? What still attracts people to the Gon? Where, where is his legacy founded? And how is Jewish life 
um, attached to him and those Jews that lived there. How is that still present today? You know, uh, if you allow me, I would uh, begin not from today today, but from the interwar period when the secular identity uh, actually uh, is very strong. Uh, it, it, it was a very strong type of identity inter, in, in, in the inter, uh, interwar Jewish community. They were actually, they were like rivaling sometimes, sometimes peacefully coexisting. But what I want, want to say that it was the time when seemingly the image of uh, such strictly religious thinker could be, you know, uh, lessened. But it wasn't, because at that time, a Vilna Jewish community recognized in his image a strong educational value in the world where Jewish identity was, could be, could be undermined by, uh, uh, um, by many, many factors. And when I am speaking about secular Jewish identity uh, in, in the interwar period, it doesn't mean atheism. It doesn't mean, uh, it doesn't mean uh, 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 just uh, turning out of your, Jewish, uh, of your Jewish roots. It does mean rethinking the traditional identity. In, in that struggle for a new Jew who would be new, but still a Jew, the image of Vilna Gaon was not only strengthened because uh, it, it he appeared in in school uh, in the books for school children in the popular editions and also his image his his portrait was a very popular publication but also the most, the most prominent portrait of uh, right. of anyone in jewish homes in the 19th century yes. Yes, was that right. of the Gaon of Vilna? Right. Usually, uh, along two others, but let's speak of Gaon. Re really, it was so. But also, the Jewish community of the interwar period made an effort to include the uh, legacy of the Gaon into the urban life, non-Jewish urban life. I mean, they uh, uh, applied to to the municipality and received a. Uh, actually a permission to name a street after uh, Vilna Gaon. And this is a paradox because it happened not in the 19th century. Oh. In the 19th century was no effort from the Jewish community, which didn't need that at that time, but exactly during the uh, uh, interwar period, when the Jewish community and the Jewish identity was very, very fragile after the First World War, there was an effort and the magistrate uh, responded positively. There was a Gaon street in Vilnius. And very symbolically, uh, I, now, uh, I, I now just come to our days. Uh, one of the first acts of the Jewish community immediately after the independence the indo lithuanian independence right in 1990 uh, was again applying to the municipality of course in the soviet time the the, the street was was renamed there were no jewish names of street during the the almost during the soviet time but the gaon street was applied for and reinstalled which we again mm. the street now and another very important uh, work of the Jewish community, not immediately because it should uh, regain its some kind of strength uh, force. In 1997, uh, the Jewish community celebrated, no, sorry, the Jewish community initiated the all uh, city, maybe all Lithuania celebration of the 200th Yard site, the the the, yeah. the anniversary of uh, death of Vilna Gaon, which was actually amazing. Why should the city celebrate not only Vilna Gaon, but actually not his birthday even, but his yard site? It is not. It is so untraditional for other cultures. Mm -hmm. But Lithuania uh, then was so enthusiastic in in that celebration that last year when it was the th uh, 300 uh, uh, birthday anniversary, 
you maybe don't know that it wasn't the Jewish community who initiated the celebration. The Jewish community, of course, enthusiastically joined it. But there were intellectuals from Lithuanian community who somehow learned about that and initiated it. Mm. In, in, both, in both cases, in cases of both celebrations, there was a lot of activities around this figure, not only about Vilnagon himself, but a lot of celebration of Jewish culture. Both times. It was actually an, a great festival of Jewish culture both times. Of course, last year it was abridged uh, by Corona. Mm. But still, what could be done was done not only towards the figure of better, better understanding of the figure of Vilna Gaon, but also of better understanding of Jewish culture. And in that, the city was great. Just Laura, great. Laura, do you happen to know, I always wondered, you know, when you visit Vilnius, you see there in this courtyard, a bust of the, an <laughs> idol, if you will, of the Vilna Gaon. Um, do you have any, do you know we, a little bit of the history of that bust? What's the, I do. What, can you tell us a little bit about that? Because anybody who goes and visits Vilnius, you'll see it's, a, for those of you who haven't, you should go. It is a beautiful, beautiful city. Um, you know, while most of the Jewish community was was destroyed, Stalin was scared to touch those churches, and uh, and and because of it, they they remained, and, and you can still feel that you could feel a part of that 18th century uh, world that the Gon inhabited. But one of the things that is still left there, or that was erected there in this little courtyard right near the street uh, named after him is a, a bust of the Vilna Gon. And I, I just was wondering if Laura could tell us a little bit about how that came to be. Yeah, I, I just regret I, I didn't prepare a, a, a photo of that bust, but maybe mm -hmm. Lynn, uh, as a follow-up, could send the, the picture. You know, it's a bit of anecdote. The, it, it was erected during the same celebrations of 200 uh, years anniversary of the Gon's death. And uh, of course, the Gaon himself wouldn't in any way, uh, you know, uh, support the idea of him uh, being presented in that 3D way just uh, goes against all Jewish uh, traditions, to, uh, religious tradition. But again, the interesting thing is that it was an initiative even then of a Lithuanian sculptor who made the bust but he died before the, it could be done anything with it. And wow. the bust was left in his, uh, you know, how do you call it, in, in, his, in his work- uh, Workshop. Workshop, you may say. He didn't call it uh, Vilna Gaon. He called it the sage. But it is known that it is an actual portrait of his friend, a Jew. I don't know what were the intentions of the artist uh, when he undertake, uh, undertook the, the, this thing, but when the celebration began, some, someone uh, or some people knew about uh, this work. It wasn't even, un it was unfinished. It was in uh, some material which wouldn't uh, be fit for, for erecting. It was finished. And it was presented as a bust of Vilna Gaon. It, there was a controversy, of course, at the time, but there was a controversy around the celebrations themselves. There were many Jews around the world who didn't support the idea, but it's a different story. The city itself now, do I like the bust? No, I don't, but I can't imagine the city without it. Mm -hmm. And it was, a step towards recognizing the Jewish presence in the city. Yes, yeah, very interesting. Very, that's, that's very important. Sometimes I think it looks even more like Karl Marx, another Jew, than the Vilna Gone. Like every and, uh, you know, and, and Jew were, was, yeah. yeah. And there were many, and there were many, many Jews who made their way from the Vilna Gone to Karl Marx over the course of the You're 19th right. and 20th century in Vilna. You're so right. it, there is a there is um, uh, more than just poetic irony there. There's there's actually some truth um, to 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 the picture, perhaps at least conceptually. Um, 
So tell us a little bit, you know, tell us a little bit about the library. In, in other words, a lot of us who, um, a lot of us who have family who came from Vilnius um, and who still celebrate uh, Vilna as part of Jewish culture, we know that every single day there are things being discovered um, in Vilnius. There was, is, was a big excavation at this point going on of the, of the great synagogue at one point. But every day also there are things being discovered by, by not just archeologists, but by archivists and by librarians. And uh, I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit about some of the things that are now being rediscovered that, that you know, certainly in the last 30 years, it takes a while for academic work to be done and for things to be uh, properly cataloged. I know there's also a great deal in, 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 in Kovno or Kaunas that there's uh, materials there as well. But what are you seeing right now in, 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 at the library that, that might be of interest to some of us here uh, from, the, from the time of the Vilna Gona and in terms of his legacy as well? Uh, you know, you think you made a mistake when you wanted to talk about archivists uh, and you used the word archaeologists. It wasn't a mistake. Of course it wasn't, because now we work really as archaeologists of documents. Every day brings something new, but just uh, in connection to Vilna Gaon, uh, it's enough to say that from the collection of the printed matters in the library, visual things and newly discovered documents, we were able last year to put a major exhibition uh, dedicated to Vilna Gaon, which was called uh, as, as one of his works, Shenot Eliyahu, the years of Elijah, uh, because, and, and why this work and not another work of Vilnagon? Of course, we know that all the names of his works were given by his editors, by, by publishers, but it's a very, a very uh, uh, meaningful, uh, meaningful name because it is a plural, plural, right? It's not a year of Vilnagon, but years. It was the year of Vilna Gaon when we did that, but we uh, uh, like suggested that from the, the lifetime of Vilna Gaon on, all years of Jewish cultures, culture in Lithuania, and of course in the world are years of Vilna Gaon because his influence is such immense and lasting. You wouldn't see now the, any edition of Talmud without his comments. It just couldn't be done. The Talmud is publishing always with his, at least the, the republishing of the Vilna Talmud is uh, always with his, his comments and so on. It was, uh, it was a pity that so little people could come and see the exhibit. I believe there is a virtual tour and uh, tour uh, in Linz, uh, Mm, archives, maybe it could be shared with yeah. the public. Lynn, Lynn just shared it on, on oh, the chat. Yeah. It's so nice. Wonderful so, video. but it's, it's uh, really, it was hard to even, you know, uh, to decide what to show because we wanted to show the period of uh, the lifetime of Vilna Gaon, his work, and also his legacy, his influence, the history of Lithuanian yeshivas. He, as we know, uh, the Gaon himself didn't teach at any public educational institution and he didn't establish the yeshiva. But uh, the founders of the yeshivas after him, just all the time they stressed that the method that they use in those Lithuanian yeshivas is the Vilna Gaon's method, method mm -hmm. of strict textual analysis, critical analysis, as you said, uh, not to being afraid of any authority and so on. And in that regard, we wanted to, to, to show the yeshivas. We also showed the popular culture of, of the 20th, 20th century, those publications and those images of Vilna Gaon that pervaded the public consciousness at that time. And what was the main discovery for me, uh, it was, and all the discoveries came from the documents themselves. It wasn't the pre-thought conception 
of the exhibit. The documents showed us what to do. And one of them, the, the major for me, the major discovery for me was that at the time of the preparations, I came across a, a, just a big manuscript book in which all the epitaphs of the Jewish, all Jewish uh, cemetery were written down. And uh, I didn't know what was the provenance of it. And I discovered that it was from Vilna Ghetto. Now mm -hmm. I have a lot of proof for that, but I don't have time to, to show all the proof. But we showed that manuscript as, a, and of course the epitaph of Vilna Gaon was copied there uh, absolutely strictly accurately. And uh, we showed that exhibit as a proof that even in Vilna Ghetto, people didn't only think about survival, strict survival, and the, you know, piece of bread, which was crucial, but it was not all. So uh, we also showed a couple of documents of the so-called Vilna, uh, Vilna Gaon clothes, the synagogue, and what happened to it during the time of Lithuanian independence, short time of Lithuanian independence, and after that, during the Soviet time. We also showed a bit the uh, disbursement of, of the collections and the testimonies about the Vilna Jewish community, which if it was not destroyed, they were not destroyed and dispersed by the Holocaust and the Soviet time, now would uh, would be uh, just a, a learning book for us, the open book. Now we see only fragments of that book. This we also wanted to show that we will never know, we will never know in full how was the lifetime of Vilna Gaon, and not only because he was so reclusive, but also because these testimonies doesn't exist, don't exist now, and why don't they exist? And so is about every period in Vilna, in Vilna Jewish history, so more precious is every little piece of it. Mm, Laura, you know, uh, listening to you, um, listening to you find these uh, gems and pearls and bring them, uh, bring them to light and to life, you know, it, it makes me, it makes me think about two things. First, it makes me think about another um, important figure, critical figure in disseminating the Gones work, um, who very few people would ever think of, of identifying most people when they think about the Gones disciples, like you said, one is Chaim Velezhin, the founder of the modern yeshiva. The other is someone named Menachem Mendel of Shklov, who along with the Israel of Shklov were the first uh, Ashkenazic Jews to make their way back to Jerusalem. If you go to Jerusalem today, you'll, the old city, you'll see uh, their synagogue that was uh, that was built there. Many uh, now consider them to be proto-Zionists, as we heard in the um, brief introduction. Although it is a highly debated uh, issue, um, one which um, probably deserves far more careful historical attention. Zionism wasn't uh, around at the beginning of the 19th century. Um, so these are the kinds of people that we, we tend to uh, highlight when we talk about the Gon students as disciples. Uh, one of the unsung heroes, someone who didn't study with him, but certainly played a critical role in disseminating his, his works and bring them to life and to light was Devorah Ram, the uh, owner of the Ram printing house, which was the primary um, a place of publication of the Gones writings and 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 the, the and and one of the chief institutions that purchased um, and that also commissioned the Gones works to be edited and uh, published. So you know what's fascinating is the Gone doesn't he talks a little bit about women, but not always in the most um, shall we say politically correct manner. Well, what's it like for you and for, you know, following the footsteps of someone like Devorah Ram, the, the, the head of the Ram printing dynasty, the, the, the leading printing dynasty of the 19th century, to be entrusted with the legacy of rabbinic, of a rabbinic life, of Litvak rabbinic life um, in the heart of, of Vilna? What's that like, you know, for you in terms of the relationship of you to these, you know, male rabbinic figures as they're 
is there something that you're also engaged in here and broadening the scope of that tradition? How do you see yourself and the work that you do in terms of that, in terms of that history and your place now as a central figure in it? What a complicated question. You know, my mm. first field, academic field was actually rabbinic literature. And my PhD, which I defended in Vilnius, was the first uh, after war dissertation on rabbinic literature in Lithuania. Uh, it seems paradoxical maybe because now I'm uh, mostly in the modern Jewish cultural history, but really the classical Jewish, classical Jewish texts and among them the, the works uh, of Vilna Gaon were uh, my fascination for a long time. Of course, I know that I'm not so much accepted in traditional circles, being a woman and, and uh, uh, but luckily I have another strong aspect of my identity. I associate myself very strongly with that secular Jewish identity of Vilnius uh, of which I was already speaking. And I saw so many examples in documents and books of men and women, of young people who were not ashamed of their being secular and were not less Jewish uh, because of that. And they knew that all that Jewish culture produced before them is their legacy. And it is the way I see things as well. Uh, I even didn't, was not born in Lithuania. So you may call it double appropriation, but I attach myself very strongly to that tradition. It was very close to me. And as a librarian and an archivist, because in, in the course of uh, my work, I became, became both, just I need, need that. Uh, I see that this is a treasure that shouldn't be compartmentalized. This is rabbinic literature, this is Jew Yiddish poetry, this is that, and this is this. No, there is one Jewish culture. And if you don't know one of its corners, you have lesser understanding on, of another. Another. Of course, you can't know all, but you can strive as, and in that being a, also a somehow an intellectual descendant of Vilna Gaon. That's what, what, what I'm trying to do in my work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. So um, uh, I, 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 I concur and, 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 uh, and, and I'm inspired by, um, by that reading of of Jewish history as well. So uh, at this time, I'm going to, uh, I think, turn things back on over to Lynn, who is hopefully um, collecting some questions from all of you. And, uh, and Laura and I will do our best uh, to uh, provide you with whatever answers we are able to provide. What a wonderful talk. Thank you both. Just a gentle reminder to the audience, if you do have questions, please paste them into the Q&A box found on your taskbar, either at the top of your screen if you're on an Apple or at the bottom of the screen if you're on a PC. Um, a question from Mark Kozanski about uh, the Vilna Gons family. You mentioned that he had eight children. Can you um, expand upon that and tell us anything you know about parents, siblings, offspring, that type of thing? Well, um, well, this is a very touchy question, Mark. Um, so let me, let me, before I start giving some of the juicy stuff, let me, and, and some, of the, some of the stuff that doesn't portray the going in the best of light, let me, let me give him some credit where credit is due. Moses Mendelssohn had probably roughly around the same number, a little bit less number of children as the Vilna Gone did. And uh, almost none of them remained Jewish. Now that's somewhat typical for the, the society that he lived in and the, and the challenges that he, he faced. Um, but the Gones children all, it seems for the most part followed in his footsteps and most notably his son Avram, who uh, himself was also a great scholar and published numerous works himself. But, um, the stories his children tell about him as a parent are very sad ones. Um, the most famous of which appears in the introduction that Abraham, his son wrote at the beginning of uh, his, uh, the Gones commentary to Caro's Code, Shulchan Aruch, in which he tells the story that um, at one point the Gones of Vilna was going to go off in solitude as he traditionally did for 
a period of time to reflect, to think, to write, to read. And uh, it turned out the day or two before his, one of his other sons became deathly ill. Nonetheless, the Goan decided to leave. This his son Abraham describes. So it's not just a, a story. It's, it seems to have some, some kind of kernel of truth. He went off into the woods and as his son Abraham says, did not think about his family, his children, or any other matter pertaining to his uh, private life for over a month. But being in the bathroom at one point, he finally, his thoughts turned away from Torah and came back to his children. And he recalled that his son was deathly ill, whereupon he finished up his business and uh, made his way back to Vilna. Luckily, the child survived. But I think the story, what it, it highlights is a, um, is a father who was at the very least out to lunch. Um, and I would say it at most, while the Gon might have been a Gon, a genius, he was no mensch. And, um, and I think that, that that's a very complicated part of his legacy. What do we do with geniuses um, who seem to be lacking in terms of their interpersonal skills? It's a, it's a very, it's a part of a much larger, much more complicated story. I don't know, Laura, do you have any tales to tell about oh, the do. parenting? I do, but maybe I, I will not, uh, we will um, follow uh, the questions. I only wanted to add that if I'm not mistaken, still the, the, this story is told by uh, Abraham as a, uh, an example of total de devotion to the to the higher values to to the Torah study, uh, it isn't presented entirely in a negative light. It is our reading of the story that uh, that is so. But uh, I I I the, let me not tell the story, but tell me uh, to, uh, remind of the letter that the uh, chairwoman of the Jewish community, Faina Kuklansky mentioned in her introduction, there is actually a letter to, to his wife that he wrote from his journey from which he was not uh, necessarily supposed to return. And so we read this text as an ethical tes testimony, as a testament, actually. So there he leaves some instructions for her, how to conduct herself, how to, how to, how to uh, access the issue of the education of children, boys and girls differently. And one of those things is rather paradoxical. All of them are very strict, but one is rather paradoxical. Uh, he says, don't go to the synagogue very often or better still, just stay at home because there is a reason for that. Because the synagogue is a place of gossip yes. and uh, idle talk. How could it be? Because of course, women go to the women uh, section of the synagogue and you don't expect them to be pious or learned if you are will not go on. You have a preconception of what, what is going, going on there as a very uh, pejorative thing, although neither man, the gun himself, of course, never was there and don't know exactly what, what, what is going on there. He doesn't leave any doubt about what, are, what women are capable of intellectually. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's not a pretty picture, but still we are reading that as his obligation, he saw some obligation to write those instructions uh, to, his, to, his, uh, to his wife, although we can interpret those instructions in very different ways. Interesting, interesting. We have a bunch of questions yeah. about the hostility between um, the Vilna Gon and the uh, Hasidic community. Can you extrapolate? Yeah. Could I, even before I answer those, I want to just clean up some of these questions to answer some of them really, really quickly so that, that, that we just have some, some taken care of that are, are done. Um, 
he never made his way to Israel. There's a great deal of debate over whether or not or to what degree he made that trip. It seems as though he tried. He might have gotten as far as Amsterdam. That's a huge debate in terms right now of the history of Zionism, that um, to what degree should the Vilna Gom be seen as a founder or not a founder of, uh, of the Zionist movements. His students certainly did uh, at the beginning of the 19th century. It's debatable to what extent the Gon did. Um, the other thing is, no, in terms of medicine, the Gon, it does not seem have that kind of knowledge. His knowledge of math and his knowledge of the sciences is more related back to mathematics, um, less so than biology per se, more in terms of uh, math, uh, more of a mathematical orientation than a, a biological one. Um, I'm gonna save one of these for later, but I, let's get back to the one that Lynn asked, which is the debate over him and the, the Hasidim. Um, him and the Hasidim. So wait, Laura, Laura do, you have a, do, you wanna, do you wanna take that one a little bit? Or so, you know, there's the, there's the normal story. He didn't like Hasidim. He really didn't like them. He never condemned Moses Mendelssohn and he was prepared to banish um, jail, excommunicate Hasidim at will. Um, I don't know what, 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 Laura, could you tell us, do you want to tell us maybe a little bit more about that fight, what it was over? How do you understand it? What does it still mean today? That fight, does it matter anymore, that fight today? Uh I think it does, but still, I would like to 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 cast a bit of doubt of his eagerness to fight Hasidim himself. I think he was more absorbed 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 in his study, and he wouldn't be bothered so much as to fight himself. I think all that was done. Of course, he gave his signature, the the permission to put his signature, or he put his signature on a harem, on a right of excommunication of Hasidim. Of course, he approved of excommunication. Of course, he approved of the uh, not letting the Hasidic movement develop in Lithuania. But did he really, uh, was he really active in that? I think not. I think uh, there were most uh, of his pupil, uh, disciples who were anyway more men uh, uh, of the world than him and he just avo uh, avoided and evaded any communication with real Hasidim as far as we know he he had a, a couple of opportunities to meet them meet their leaders and discuss but he declined and he didn't use the opportunity to to express his opinions he didn't do that. And uh, I think it was more of ideological position of the united front of his disciples. But on the other hand, it does have a meaning today because even uh, if we know that in the 19th century, the second part of the 19th century, century several Hasidic, Hasidic communities were already established in Vilnius and there were several of Hasidic synagogues and so it went through the 20th century and also throughout Lithuania, we still know that that artificial isolation ha helped to clarify the Mitnagdic, Mitnagdic thought. And we see that uh, in the works of the Vilna Gaon himself, in the works of the Chaim of Volozhin, who dis uh, debated the Hasidic uh, uh, thought in, in his works and so on. So we have that, that written legacy of how Mitnagdim thought. And I think it is a great, greatly important thing. Um, so we have another one here that's a real, I, I, I by the way, Bilara, I, I don't know. I, 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 I think that the Vilna Gon writes and speaks very cryptically. So, you know, the thing is no, none of his students ever contested. And there were a lot of things that people contested. There was a very great debate over the extent to which he endorsed secular studies or didn't like philosophy or did like philosophy. And we see 
that being debated throughout the course of the 19th century. But the, the, the virulent disdain, if not hatred of, of, of Hasidim, none of his students really contest. Um, but the real question is what was at stake at that time? And, and, and what was at stake was not Hasidim as we see them today for better or for worse. Um, what was at stake was, you know, this was only a hundred years after Shabkai Tzvi. Um, that legacy was still around. Uh, we have to remember, you know, when we talk about a hundred years, we're only, you know, we really are at this point only about 80 or 90 years away from, uh, from the Holocaust. So there were strong memories still of Shabtai Tzvi that were there. And there was a lot of fear that, that, that this movement was heading in a direction out of, of, of Jewish culture and Jewish life. So I think that that was a great cause of concern for him, although not the only one. Um, so I guess we'll, you know, I, I understand what you're saying, Laura. I think we might have a slight disagreement, but I, I, I think there are two sides to this, um, to this, to this debate. Um, the other question you know, I still see here, Lynn, if I'm gonna, I see Jacqueline leaves one here on, do, has one, do you think that the gone might have been autistic on the spectrum? So I'm gonna tell you a, a little story on this. Um, so it, the re, every time since I published my book, I don't know, Laura, do you get asked that question a lot also? I get asked that question a lot. Do you get asked that one when you talk about uh, it? No, I, it don't. is the first for me. <laughs> What? This is the first time. Okay. So I get asked that question a lot after I wrote my book. And I, I think, you know, if people who read my book and who, after they hear me talk on him, and, you know, I, I have to put it this way. Um, I, when I was going to write my book about the Gone, I was actually in, in Oxford at the time at the Brasenose College. And there was a leading, one of the leading um, specialists on sleep and on, um, on um, you know, questions about people being on the spectrum, man, and Professor uh, Russell Foster was there. And uh, Russell Foster specialized in sleep deprivation and, um, and how that might, you know, generate or be reflective of people on the spectrum. And so I met with him because the bone famously only slept two hours uh, a night. Um, and that's true. That story is true. That's not uh, that from all from from what we can tell, that story is uh, there's validity to it. Um, and I described to him. I sat down with with, uh, with Professor Foster, and I described to him the various traits, the eating habits, um, the relationship to family, the the kind of writing style, all the various characteristics of his personality, and and he's. He seemed, as well as I was after reading what he had told me to read, that he was somewhere on the spectrum, let's put it that way. I decided not to put that in the book because to begin with, there were enough controversial things in the book that, um, that got under the nerves of, 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 of various, uh, you know, let's call them more religious or, or, or observant community. I thought that that was a little bit speculative at the time. I think if I were to write it again today, I probably would put it in, not as a statement so much of uh, deficiency, but rather of one of great triumph. Um, and, and, and the fact that, you know, people on the spectrum, you know, we, we, we should be embracing and seeing those people as, as, accept, as having exceptional capacities. Um, and just because in one sphere they seem to be, um, uh, slightly more challenged, that that those weaknesses also can um, can can create or, or generate great um, projects in other places. Wonderful. Um, we will ask one last question, and I think this is a wonderful question to end on. Um, Julia asks, "What do you consider as the most relevant aspects of his legacy in the twenty first century and for the future?" Right. Laura, you wanna you're you're there on the ground. You wanna do you know I'll first maybe say one or two things and then I'm gonna let Laura get the get the last word. I think right now there's a real lively debate in Israel, especially going on. Um, one which concerns me actually. 
which is, you know, we, we most people traditionally have thought that Theodore Herzl is the founder of, of Zionism. And there are certain connotations that come with it, his experiences at the Dreyfus trial, his establishment of a large national and largely secular um, uh, Jewish national project. Um, and that legacy is now being contested by a number of, of different interest groups and even some scholars um, who would like to argue that in fact, it's not so much Herzl, but rather the Gona Vilna, um, who should be seen as the founder of the Zionist movement. Herzl never made his way to Palestine as well, in, in a sense. He also never, um, he didn't end up living there. So um, the fact that uh, the fact that the Gon now, now competes with Herzl uh, to me is, is something that is very concerning, not to diminish the Gones' influence and importance, but simply to say that uh, I don't necessarily want to see Zionism as being related back or being specific to or defined by the kind of spiritual, religious, and, and elitist project of the Vilna Gon. So I think on one hand, that's a very big debate that's happening in newspapers and in journals and among uh, intellectuals in, in Israel today. And of course, in the United States, we've seen a resurgence of, of orthodoxy um, in America and it, an increasingly prominent place that it plays in politics and in, in, in the representation of Jews where the Gon's legacy certainly is is attached to that. So that's where I see a lot today, as well as finally in this, I'll hang up to Lara, you know, the continued fascination of Jews and intellectual achievement as a means of upward social mobility. And in many ways that, you know, that is, is the, the most prominent legacy of the goal. That idea of Jewish genius itself and the unique contributions specific to the intellectual sphere and the critical sense that, that the goal um, has been associated with. So that's, you know, what I think moving forward where I see his legacy. Lara, do you want to add anything from Lithuania? Oh, yes. From I Europe? would like to add just one aspect and exactly from the Lithuania perspective. Uh, for me, the legacy of Vilna Gon, one of, of the uh, important points of that legacy of relevance of his image, even in the uh, 21st century, is that uh, as we talked today uh, a lot, he became some kind of a symbol of a Vilna Jewish community, Vilna and Lithuania Jewish spirituality. And not having a lot of that, to put it very mildly, mildly uh, today, uh, we, uh, we uh, in our own experience, we can't produce having such a small uh, Jewish community today, we can't produce such achievements, of course, but, and, and, st and, and because of that, we could be quite forgotten in the Jewish world and in the uh, broader world. But such figures as Vilna Gaon, which uh, were not forgotten and still are very intriguing, re return people to Vilnius return it to the Vilna Jewish community. And, and if, if I could uh, just uh, translate from Hebrew, return with a question. What was it? It is still intriguing. What was that community that could produce such figures? And this, I uh, just, uh, this is a great thing for me. We still have people who come to Vilnius searching, searching for that community and searching for its uh, connection to the current day's community. And uh, it is, uh, that's why the figure of Vilna Gaon, even if we don't understand it, the, uh, it, the legacy fully, we can feel its relevance and its importance even now. 
Thank you both um, for those remarks and for this wonderful, enlightening conversation. I know I learned um, a lot and I'm sure that many people in our audience did as well. I want to make sure to thank the Lithuanian Culture Institute, the General Consulate of Lithuania in New York and the Lithuanian National Library, as well as Lara and Ali for uh, spending their time with us this afternoon. Thank you to everyone in the audience. And if you are in Boston, please visit vilnashol.org to come and join us for an in-person tour of one of our uh, of our historic building and learn more about our institution and if not we hope to see you in Boston sometime in the near future now that the travel restrictions have been lifted and the world is getting a little bit back to normal thank you everyone the recording will be available on our YouTube page next week and we will send out a reminder email tomorrow with a list of resources as well have a good day everyone thank you and I hope to see at least some of them of you in Vilnius Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you all. Thank you all.